let me begin by saying thank you so much for uh, joining this project and being a part of it. Uh, I'm really, really excited and very happy to talk to you uh, about this subject. I'm really sure that a lot of people will benefit from it. I'm looking forward, uh, as you know, this is a process that I'm going through personally as well, as much as I want to share the process. And I feel uh, that was why I was looking forward for our talk so much, because I, I felt that there's a lot I will benefit myself, and I'm sure that's a good way of, to know that others will benefit as well. So in terms of both uh, the modern mar martial arts community and the um, Aikido community, I think it's going to be a treasure. Uh, uh, any, do you have any thoughts before, I mean, obviously we are starting already, but do you have any uh, thoughts about the subject itself or what do you expect from the talk uh, as before we move on uh, into it? I like that you have a personal interest after getting direct experience uh, with, you know, rounding out your martial experience and, and putting Aikido in a different context, really understanding what it is you've been doing these last 10 years, uh, what, the, what the benefits are, what the cons are. Um, you know, you're just reframing the, the knowledge base that you have. And to be personally motivated to go, undergo that process is, um, is critical because it's not an easy process to go through. Um, there, there are some introspective moments where you have to be honest and occasionally some ideas or preconceptions that you had get um, erased or popped or shadowed or um, any variety of adjectives to describe disillusionment. Uh, but through that disillusionment, comes a different kind of understanding and a deeper sense of confidence. So I think you're doing something really courageous and you're on the right path and just engaging in this dialogue is gonna help a lot of people. Great, cool, thank you. Uh, well, uh, I do have some questions I, I, I mentioned to you before that I, I, I'm really interested to look in uh, with you. But actually one thing that comes to me uh, I, I believe you, you do mention in the contact we had before that you had a, a somewhat of a similar experience of uh, training Aikido for, for a long time and being devoted uh, to it and then having that moment where you meet the modern martial arts uh, and, you, and there's that understanding, at least I had it, and, and I had the sense that you went through something similar at a certain point of your uh, martial arts career, that moment of where, you, where that realization comes that the training before wasn't necessarily all that um, connected with what is done uh, outside of the Aikido uh, community. Uh, was that present in your, in your development as a martial artist? Absolutely. I was probably 20 years old and I was doing Aikido pretty seriously uh, up in Anchorage, Alaska. I trained very often and was very devoted but when it came to cross training, I, and I was really the only one, the only people doing any kind of cross training in my, in my dojo, um, I met up with a wrestler and this wrestler was, um, he was a blue belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Um, it was awarded to him by somebody who was not truly, uh, reputable, but knew a few things and my friend was uh, just a very intense individual. Like when he would wrestle or spar with you, he would be 100% or more. And so when we got together, he was looking for training partners online. Um, he had burned through a couple of training partners. And eventually we got together. Uh, we met at like a, a YMCA or a public recreation center. And we ended up just sparring uh, and not that softly either. It was full on sparring. And I found that the Aikido training that I had undergone for the last two years, keep in mind, I was a black belt in Judo already. I had received my black belt in Judo at 16 in Japan, I was 17 in Japan. But my Aikido training was, it was not helping. It did not, it was, he blew through the range where my Aikido would have been effective immediately. It, immediately, he would just charge in with double leg, take me down. Mm. And my judo training is the only thing that really saved me from total annihilation. Right. So 
being able, that was a real wake up call. It was kind of disheartening. Mm. Uh, I loved Aikido. I loved the way it made me feel. I loved the, the way it was shaping who I was. Mm. And, but it, it didn't square. Like what actually happened um, in, it's not completely without rules, but it was definitely a free form environment. Yeah. Did not align whatsoever with what was happening in the dojo. Mm. And, you know, and I realized that something was off and I needed to do something different. Now, what doing something different meant, mm. I wasn't sure. Mm. But I ne knew I needed to change my training in order to meet this challenge. Mm. Mm. Was it there, if I jump in here, uh, was it there where you had a f develop a sense for BJJ or was it later or before already? Well, I started to, at that time, BJJ was not available in Alaska. Mm. Um, we had a judo club, we had an Aikido club, and we had a variety. We even had some uh, more Japanese jiu-jitsu schools, mm. but we didn't have BJJ. Mm. So when I finally got, my solution to this problem was to, in order to fight the way I wanted to fight, which was mm -hmm. essentially in the Aiki manner, when people would come in, I wanted to be able to be like Steven Seagal. I want to know those techniques, to be able to deal with opponents in that way. Mm -hmm. Because in my experience in Judo, Judo was really rough. Mm -hmm. Judo is rough and tumble. Uh, occasionally you get like a perfect throw and a perfect technique that you execute where everything feels great. But it's kind of messy. Judo is war. Mm -hmm. And I wanted a, a cleaner, more efficient route. Um, so I devoted myself to training that was a little bit different. I moved into, I became an uchideshi and moved into the dojo of a Japanese jiu-jitsu master. Mm. Basically, Aiki jiu-jitsu. Mm. Um, this was a sister art of Aikido. Mm. Um, this uh, Japanese jiu-jitsu system, Seibukan, was from uh, Hakoryu jiu-jitsu, mm. which was at the same time Aikido was, was developed. Hakuryu was uh, also developed, and he was a um, he was a student of of um, Sokaku Takeda as well. Mm. So there were some techniques that had been removed from the Aikido syllabus. Um, it's a very in depth art, and it really helped inform like okay, this is where Aikido came from. This is what was taken out. These are additional technical options. These are additional movement options. Mm. Yet it still did not meet that bar of being able to deal deal with like a division one wrestler or somebody just really, really tough that knew how to grapple. Um, mm. It was playing with these jujitsu and Aiki jujitsu techniques, but it wasn't until Brazilian jujitsu that I, I started to um, really get the confidence to be able to to handle adversaries uh, regardless of their background. Yeah, yeah. I see. Uh, again, to jump in, it's it's interesting that the your story about uh, when when you started sparring with your friend. Uh, it's funny enough. That's exactly what happened to me. It's been maybe three years ago. Uh, and I've already had quite the, the years in Aikido, but no Judo, a little bit of Karate, Wing Chun, so not much. Uh, so I can imagine how great it was for you to have Judo behind. I didn't have that. But also a friend of mine who, who did some BJJ, also a blue belt, I was sparring with him. He introduced me to BJJ and that's where I fell in love with it. But I also just realized I just can't do anything. I'm just like doesn't doesn't come up there was that sense that aikido is somewhere in there that maybe but but also there was that sense that maybe after years or or a lot of practice i could blend the two together but straight away i felt helpless and i realized he's a blue belt so what would happen if i would go against uh, with a black belt so so yeah it's funny i can really relate relate to that moment and it, there are some similarities even there uh, and, and I was also about to jump in and say, when you mentioned about the tra traditional, would it be okay if I would say traditional jiu-jitsu or uh, the Aikido yes, jiu-jitsu? Yes, that'd be accurate. Okay. So uh, that I was also wondering when you were talking about it, I was wondering, okay, so did that help? Because I see, 
And the topic that I'm bringing up, I started off with Aikido as a traditional martial art and modern martial arts, meaning BJJ, MMA. Uh, that's at least that's how I just frame them. Not necessarily that's the way to do it, but it helps me to relate to them. Uh, and I realized as I posted the videos and I started seeing people's comments and I investigated into the topic, I realized that it's not a, only Aikido. Uh, Aikido gets a lot of crap these days, I'll be honest. Uh, I see I, plan, I publish so many Aikido videos, so there's so many comments and I kind of have the image of where people's um, uh, understand, where how people relate to the, to the art. And it's quite bad. It's quite <laughs> that, uh, especially from, from modern martial art people. But I realized this problem is not necessarily only with Aikido. It's just Aikido is just so obvious. It's, it's hard to bring Aikido into the other context. But other martial arts suffer from that uh, too. And so I was, I was wondering in my uh, thoughts if, if traditional jiu-jitsu helped you uh, deal with this, with this situation. But, but it seems that it's, it's not only Aikido that is facing this problem. W would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. Any of these, any of these traditional martial arts forms, um, mm. they have some really amazing. They have, I mean, technique is technique, mm. but it's really about the training methods. And if your training methods don't allow for failure and for real discovery of, of things that work for you and your particular body type, um, and you can work those strategies and techniques that, you know. Um, it's not a one-size-fits-all world. Mm. Mm. You need to tailor these things. Mm. And I think that traditional martial arts, if they're done for movement or exercise or cultural exploration or just health, these are good things. But mm. if they're, but ultimately, I think people expect more from a martial art. Mm. If it's a martial art, it really should have some martial value. Right. Um, and it will get mocked and derided if it doesn't have any of that, any of that martial value. Mm. If you use the term martial arts, mm. people expect a certain amount of martial efficacy that mm. comes with that. Mm. It needs to be able to work at least to some degree. Mm. And Aikido, unfortunately, because people are having an educated response to the stimulus in their ukemi, and it looks spectacular. The more magical it looks, mm. uh, the more, at, at once people are in awe of that. They're like, oh, that's incredible. I want to be able to do that. Mm. And now people realize that, I mean, what was once magical is now it looks terrible. <laughs> it, lo it, lo it looks bad, mm. you know, mm. because people have seen a lot of real fighting mm. and it doesn't go down like that. Yeah. You know, it doesn't go down like that. Mm. Totally. When we are looking at all of this, uh, what do you then feel is the place? Do you feel Aikido has as it is? Does it have a place in the modern world or, or do you feel it has to transform? Do you feel there is a solution without transforming or it's all about transforming or there's a middle ground? Uh, how, how do you see it? I think Aikido sh sh has several different uses. Number one, it's a more inclusive and accommodating art that gets more people connected. Look, all martial arts are part of the answer. Mm. They bring people together. They make people understand uh, the forces of physics. They allow people to create friendships. They encourage exercise and movement. I think these are critical, especially as we head into this increasingly digital age where people are separated. Right. Um, and more isolated than ever. So I think Aikido is very welcoming and very inclusive. And I think there is definitely a role for it to play in our society. Yeah. Uh, in terms of it as a martial art, it definitely needs some revitalization. Yeah. It's not enough to... I'm not saying we need to get rid of the kihon. I mean, the, the standard yeah. repertoire of techniques is, is totally yeah. fine. But you need a little bit more. You need more in the training method, and you also need more in the follow-up. Um, if your initial technique doesn't work or they resist, mm -hmm. you need to have that plan B. And if that doesn't work, you need to have plan C. And if that doesn't work, go back to plan A. Mm -hmm. 
But if you are without those kind of contingency plans, um, it's just, it's really stripped uh, the art of any kind of martial vitality. So I do think there's a place for Aikido. I think it needs to be revitalized. And I think that Aikido is also a really unique way of training jujitsu. It allows you to really feel what those blending moments are like. And I can hit those on the mat. Um, I'm at a level in BJJ where I feel very smooth, very controlled, mm. and I can take people's balance easily and submit them, you know, pretty easily uh, mm. without a lot of, I can just kind of work around the resistance. Mm. Um, that takes a while to get to, but it's totally possible. Mm. And I think I'm able to do that partially because of my Aikido background. Mm. And I think for BJJ players and other traditional Japanese Jiu Jitsu players, mm. sometimes they're taught to just oppose, they're not taught to blend enough. Mm. And so being able to go into basically a lab where you experiment and play in a cooperative fashion mm. with extreme blending, for lack of a better term, mm. uh, you know, really an idealized form of jiu-jitsu like Aikido mm. I think there's some really valuable lessons there and I think it, it teaches you a lot about you know fine motor control coordination alignment timing mm. um, and what a really beautifully executed technique can feel like mm. but in actuality it doesn't often feel like that yeah yeah mm. Mm. So we had a few contact moments before, and I listened through as much as I could before our interview, before I talk uh, to what you said in, in other places. So I would have a feeling for for your worldview and and the Aikido and BJJ, and uh, something you said really excited me, and I feel it's a bit connected to to what you said. Uh, so to start off, um, I I do note I did notice as well that some like some BJJ black belts, uh, the way they do. Uh, BJJ almost has a sense of that ideal of where Aikido is uh, striving to go, whether it's flow or whether it's non-competitive mind. Even in one of your videos on the website, you mentioned winning against yourself, which is basically the, the one of the core lessons of, of Aikido. Uh, and then in the connection moments we had in the, in the, in the recent past, uh, you did mention something, uh, at least on the side, that how powerful it would be to have an individual who would be a martial artist and would be a very um, capable, uh, a, so a really efficient martial artist, and uh, he would be coming from an Aikido background, or meaning from the Aikido philosophy, like Osensei uh, apparently was able to do that. He was all he was about peace. He was about blending, but he was just extremely powerful. Uh, do you feel that that is ever possible? Do you feel like Aikido could at least somewhere go to that direction where the peace concept would be maintained, but that sense of efficiency and power would manifest as well that would be acknowledged by other martial artists? Do you feel that blending of those two is possible whatsoever? Absolutely. Hmm. But you have to go... Uh, it's hard to get there for, by being soft. Mm. I think you have to go there by being hard. Right. right. And then you smooth it out mm. and you get what is perceived as being soft. Mm. You know, I mm. say soft is just hard enough. Mm. Um, I, I think it's absolutely possible for people to be able to, you know, have that Aikido philosophy of nonviolence and you know, true victory is victory over yourself. Mm. Um, and be able to be martially effective, but with a really peaceful message. And uh, I think a lot of people aspire to that. And that's one of the main um, draws of Aikido. It's a huge and very powerful attractant. On the other hand, mm. if, you, if you're not able to I mean, let me see how I put this. Um, if 
you're not doing a service to the art if there isn't um, a lot of martial validity to it. Mm. And I think that uh, people are just doing a lot of soul searching right now mm. uh, on, on whether or not you can actually philosophize about peace if you have no ability to make it happen. Peace has to be begged for rather than negotiated or extended as an option. Mm. It's much better to, you know, be a warrior in the gardener than a gardener in war, mm. right? But mm. you, you, need, you need that ability, and I think it's absolutely possible. We just need to mix up some training methods and do some serious introspection uh, within the art to see how that happens. Mm. Mm. I feel that Aikido instructors and Aikido students believe that Aikido is very, very unique in a lot of the mm. relationships that it has. For example, the um, uke tori relationship mm. or the, you know, the partner relationship, the, the philosophy of nonviolence. Right. I mean, I think all of those things came from jujitsu. Mm. So right. they're already there. It's really not that unique. Mm. Maybe it's more things are cut out. Maybe things are a little bit more defined as the ideal. But a, a lot of this, um, a lot of things I see presented by Aikido teachers as being exceptionally unique. It's the only one that is this way. It's, it's really not. Mm. Um, it's a beautiful art mm. and it's, there's only there's is a really one Aikido. I don't know. I think Aikido is continually evolving and unfolding. And Aikido, true Aikido, is more of an approach to me, mm -hmm. an approach to jujitsu, an approach to daily life, mm -hmm. than a codified set of techniques. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, because there's. I feel, well, we touched already a few subjects, and uh, I was about to ask what do you feel are the difficulties Aikido is facing as a martial art, uh, and it does, well, obviously we named quite a few. Let's say if it's, if it's, if it's not necessarily the most unique thing about that, uh, what do you feel Aikido has to offer? What do you feel Aikido is unique about? Uh, do you feel that there is a unique part which could be emphasized and uh, made uh, interesting for the modern world? I think that the the sword work makes it pretty unique. Mm. I think the emphasis on weapons uh, and body alignment and extension through the weapon, for example, with a boken or a jo, uh, I think that's really cool. It's not it's not that unique, but mm. uh, I think the unique footwork based off of kenjutsu. Mm. Um, is somewhat unique, but I mean, is it is it unique in isolation? No, it's not completely unique, um, and it, it it certainly is not the only the only art with a knife takeaway, um, or, but I, I I do think having the whether it's a boken or an iaito or kenjutsu, um, the tie in with the sword and kind of the awareness of sword work and the safe angles um, to get out of that range of combat, I think that's pretty unique to Aikido. Mm. And I think that's something that uh, really influences the movement and it makes it um, very special. Mm. But then besides that, there is a bit of a sense that uh, what you said is true, that many Aikido instructors tr distinguish Aikido and, and kind of try to where that lack of efficiency is, uh, even myself, I do that, I have to be honest. I try to say, okay, but but Aikido has this unique philosophy and a unique perspective. It does seem to me now from what you say that in your experience, it is already uh, also in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Uh, is there is that experience there? You can have a very compassionate approach to BJJ where, you know, it's basically BJJ is essentially eliminating movement options in the other person. Mm. You know, you take a person from standing where they can move freely, you put them on their back. 50% mm. of their movement options are gone immediately. Mm. Then if you can get around their legs, 
then they have even fewer movement options. Mm. Plus you have gravity and your body weight on top of them. Mm. And then in going for a submission, you isolate one or two limbs, maybe an arm and, a, and uh, the head for a choke or maybe just the arm mm. for an arm lock. And so you're, you're just eliminating movement options and honing in on a submission with mm. the partner. And it's, it's, it's really not, and you're not there to destroy them. You're there to essentially get them to capitulate mm. and to leave them, to have them surrender and then to leave them as unharmed as is possible. Mm. So that's the ideal. And there's no reason that, um, I don't really see that differing significantly from Aikido. Mm. Uh, I, and as Bruce Bookman uh, once said, you know, a, a choke is just as compassionate as a wrist lock. Mm. In fact, it might even be more compassionate. You're not leaving any lasting damage. Mm. Uh, I think any of the techniques can be pl applied in an Aiki manner. Mm. Uh, and I, I definitely feel that um, Gracie Jiu Jitsu or Brazilian Jiu Jitsu can also uh, correlate to a nonviolent philosophy. It is interesting that, as I, as I mentioned before, when uh, what I, where I was very impressed by jiu-jitsu, by Brazilian jiu-jitsu, and I, I I didn't see that much. I, I have a feeling that there's the whole spectrum too. But the ones I met uh, were, including yourself, were just really nice people, really really great people, very inspiring and very powerful at the same time. Which is kind of what Aikido is hoping for, uh, at least in the back of its mind, to create these individuals which are peaceful and powerful at the same time. It's just sometimes it feels like uh, more or less we are failing a bit as a, as a community to do that, which I'm concerned about. Uh, but on the other hand, and I want to be as brutally honest about this whole subject because otherwise I feel like we cannot make an omelet without breaking an egg. Uh, the difficulty I see in Aikido is that uh, a lot of uh, people I met in Aikido, and obviously I met more Aikido people than BJJ people, but I met good ones, obviously, the, at least the ones which are around the, the community I'm in. Uh, I love these people, but uh, outside of my community, it's often enough I meet pretty bad people, like uh, not necessarily caring or, or the arrogance question is not out of the question there, uh, which in uh, BJJ so far it wasn't the case that I saw. Uh, I was contemplating about that and I was thinking maybe it's because in Aikido you lose in the beginning more or less because you're a beginner, you don't understand things, there's so much to understand and you kind of uh, suck at it. So that's kind of the failing part which, which I feel is, is, is very important for an individual. But then when I look at BJJ, that failing is just there all the time. It's such an inherent part of it. Uh, which brings the humbleness and eventually brings the power, but they, they blend together very nicely. Uh, do you feel that uh, BJJ, and, and I'm asking you because you're, 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 it's such a big part of your life, do you feel that BJJ really develops that quality of that great personality or is it just a coincidence that that happened in my perspective? And do you feel that, on the other hand, Aikido sometimes has the problem that where the thought I didn't finish is that in the beginning you train, 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 uh, and you fail, but then eventually you become a black belt, you become a sensei, and then nobody questions you, you know everything, and there's no pressure testing, so you don't fail anymore, you're kind of semi-god, and it's just easy to become arrogant in that. It's easy to become deluded, which is probably one of the main problems of Aikido these days. So would you, would you find that these two parts in the martial art is there uh, and Aikido is facing that problem and BJJ sometimes has the upper hand in that one? I, I mean, look, Rokas, you're, you're waking up. Yeah. You're, you're, you're waking up. I can tell by the, by the, these assessments that you're doing, mm. this is what, this is, you're on the right path. Mm. It's ironic that the more competitive art leads to often individuals that are more humble than the non-competitive art. Mm. I mean, there, there are all kinds of unusual opposites in this world, and that is certainly one of them. Uh, when it comes to, now, BJJ does not eliminate all uh, 
dickheads. <laughs> there are some people that still hang out. I mean, look, it's a magnifier. If you're a nice person, it makes you into a really nice person. Right. If you're an insecure prick, it will make you into... It has the possibility of rehabilitating you, but it's not going to be a cure-all. Mm. But the process of going to class, losing, paying your dues, being humbled through loss, and the person that just beat you, I mean, they've lost a thousand times before. It's not a big deal for them to tap you. It might be a big deal to you initially that you lost, but to them, they're like, whatever, you know. It's, it's just part of training. Mm -hmm. And then as you continue the march of time, you realize that winning and losing in whether it's a competition match or happens to be in the dojo, that's just comes with territory. Mm -hmm. And that failure, I think the failure more than the winning and losing, the failure rate in BJJ, mm -hmm. because I'm telling you about a third of my techniques fail, even, even now. You know, I go for an arm lock. Mm. I don't always get it. Mm. Sometimes mm. I get the third attack. I go for an attack, mm. boom, they block it. Mm. Then I go for something else, they block it. But in, re in response to that second attack, they end up setting something up that I'm able to capitalize on. Mm. So I think it's more in the inherent failure of the techniques, techniques that were almost properly executed, but weren't fully executed um, you know, in the proper manner. Whereas in Aikido, techniques hardly ever fail, man. <laughs> you know, yeah. it, it, you, it's, it, there's a lot of collusion going on. There's a lot of, I will tank for you and you tank for me mm. and we'll call it harmony. Mm. And, and that is not really that good. And when it comes to, I have met some really incredibly arrogant people in Aikido. And I, I mean, believe, and they've tried to, it's, it's shocking. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really it's shocking. shocking. And they're so, and yet there's no way for them to get checked. Yeah. And I mean, when I was a younger man, I remember going to some seminars and these people were just absolute, so high on themselves. Right. And they would get wrecked if they met up with like a tough BJJ purple, I mean, wrecked and, but you know, that's not for me to teach them that lesson. Yeah. That is just where they're at and they'll probably never be tested. So they'll just walk around in their delusion and BJJ just pops that man. Mm. It pops it right away. And a lot of people don't like that. And, and some people do, and I like it. It keeps me grounded. Yeah. Um, and, and the techniques I managed to pull off, I know I really earned them. And there's something to that, that, um, is beyond the aesthetic quality of a beautiful Aikido technique or beyond the theory. I mean, there's, there's direct experience. And what you did when you sparred with that MMA, MMA guy was direct fight experience. Mm. And that is worth like three months of training. Mm. Every time you do something like that, mm. that's, that is, these are really valuable experiences. Mm. And once you get to a certain level, people just do not challenge you anymore. In Aikido? You know? In Aikido, and then also, I mean, it, it still happens in BJJ a little bit. Mm. Um, the, the guy is teaching, he's not sparring with the students anymore, he's not, mm. you know, he's kind of let himself go. It happens occasionally. Mm. It, it, it does. It, I don't think any art is really immune from that. Mm. But the tendencies do seem to go there in, in terms of what I uh, presented and uh, that it's more because you, you spend a lot of time in Aikido too and it's, it's interesting that naturally kind of I feel we're, we're going right now to that dark bottom and, uh, and I am envisioning that as we touch the bottom then we can push up and see where we go to the light but until we uh, while we're still going to that bo dark bottom uh, just to allow the conversation to stay there a bit uh, it did seem that you met more arrogant people like men mentioned like really bad arrogant people in right. Aikido versus BJJ uh, the tendency does seem to be true in your experience that that these tendencies 
have have a chance to more naturally happen in one area than the other. For sure. But I feel we're going down to the dark bottom and I do know, I do feel that there's the light <laughs> ahead, but it's just hard in Aikido, it's hard in this subject not to touch both uh, because I feel that that delusional side is again a threat if we just try to be all nice about Aikido and we go, it, there's this, there's this um, great um, phrase, quote or story that I love, uh, that a guy comes uh, to, to an attic which wasn't touched for a long time and he starts, he, t he finds a, a broom and he opens the shutters and it all looks nice and he says, well, there's the broom so I'm going to just start sweeping and he starts sweeping and then the dust comes up and then uh, he starts to cough and there's no air and the, the first thing he says to himself is like, I shouldn't have started, it just made it worse. So, you know, I kind of feel like we're almost there where some there's a lot of dust in the subject that it's without, it's hard to clean without bringing up, uh, to clean this up without bringing up the dust uh, and just facing mm -hmm. the, the difficulties, the, the, yeah, the, the nasty side of all the things, which maybe as, as I'm thinking out loud, maybe Aikido has a bit of a tendency to cover up and then potentially that is uh, stopping it from evolving. Do you feel uh, similar to that way or how do you feel about this in terms of going to the dark side of Aikido to, to find the light there rather than to try to stay on the surface and uh, go from there? I think it's always difficult to be Im impolite, but are you really being impolite if you're, it depends on the situation. Um, you know, putting your lips on somebody is definitely a little bit forward if you don't know them. But if they're choking to death and you're doing CPR, <laughs> it's totally okay. And it does, but it does feel and, like we're more or less doing that, which is crazy, I think. Which, which, which might seem a little bit crazy, but I feel like this is a great, this is the time. We need to have the talk. Mm. We, we gotta have the talk. And, and what you're saying about Aikido and arrogance. I met some really great, incredible martial artists in Aikido, um, and people that are cross trained, and uh, and even people that you know are just Aikidoists, and and that's it. And that I, I respect them and I admire their skill level, and they're they're phenomenal. But you know, let's not let's not get too involved in the fantasy. It's nice to have a reality check on what your skill level actually is and what you're able to do in a situation where you don't control all of the environments. Uh, you, I'm sorry, you don't control all of the um, elements in the environment. And that includes the size of your attacker, the method of attack. Um, you have to be truly be able to blend with all of these. And I see that as ultimately a, the best Aikido philosophy. I think Aikido has a real opportunity to be the yes, we can art and not the no, we're not that art. Why not learn Brazilian Jiu Jitsu as an Aikidoist? Why, why the resistance? Why don't we blend with it? I think Aikido has a really unique opportunity to become a yes, we can art instead of a no, we can't. And Instead of saying, oh, we don't do that, we don't go to the ground, we, you know, if we execute a technique properly, there would never be, or even worse, relying on that terrible, terrible samurai, this came from samurai arts, and you would never go to the ground, and blah, blah. that is like the worst thing ever. It's so desperate, you know, Aikido should be, oh, um, they have a really cool method of knife fighting. Oh, well, let me take a look at that and see how I can apply Aikido concepts and be familiar with those attacks so that I can work my art. Let me understand how to move on the ground without friction and escape somebody's body weight so that I can go back into my realm. There should be absolutely no resistance to learning new things. And that will inform the art and make it um, basically re reinvigorated for an entire new generation. Uh, that is where I feel Aikido has the opportunity to go. And unfortunately, 
there's this preservation of, for an egoless art, there's so much preservation of who we are. Don't you know who I am? I'm Aikido. I'm not jujitsu. I'm more evolved than jujitsu. I mean, it's like we're feeding into this kind of, this kind of it, this kind of uh, identity of what the art is and what it is not. And I think that's limiting. And those limitations are coming to the fore right now. Yeah, I was I was quite shocked. Uh, and, uh, I re- already, as I mentioned, I did some sparring before on, on the BJJ level, and that whole uh, realization of how Aikido is and what Aikido is not started to come up. Uh, but uh, some t- some new things came up as I released the video and I investigated into the topic, and I really went through the comments and I really tried to understand what people mean and how they feel, whether they're from Aikido and they hate me, or whether they're Aikido and they are happy, or modern martial arts, etc. Uh, and uh, one of the things I came to start to realize is that uh, the I, I simply call it the modern martial arts community, or even Aikido people who are more have a modern, more modern perspective. Uh, but especially the modern martial arts community, they're upset in terms of Aikido, not about the art itself, because the, what I was reflecting, people are not upset about kendo, or I never actually just heard people being upset about kendo. Uh, or Tai Chi, which has some martial art, as far as I know, some martial art background, or even Capoeira. Again, these are not my realm, but it just never occurred to me that it's as present as uh, as the bad feelings towards Aikido or a bit of the sum of the traditional martial arts. And I started to kind of come to the conclusion that people are upset not about the training method, but about the fact that uh, the, the, whole, the whole mentality of those people who are training that that they believe that, and they, that's where the bit of the arrogance comes from. They believe that, oh yes, it will work. Or as you kind of mentioned, uh, there's that belief of we are more evolved, we are better. And I almost feel like that's the problem that people have, not with the art itself as much as it can evolve and it can, be, it can become better, but that people are troubled by that, by that perspective and that bad relationship uh, with the rest. Uh, which probably, as I think out loud again, which probably happens because Aikido people are so much against cross-training, uh, which I will still want to look into with you just in a moment. But uh, do, you, do you feel, as you know, again, as you're more in the modern martial as you're so aware in the modern martial arts uh, community, do you feel that that could be an Aikido problem too, that it's not only about Aikido itself, but the mentality it has and the approach it has to other martial arts? That's definitely part of the issue. Mm. You know, any kind of arrogance, uh, essentially, and, you know, I, maybe I'm, I'm just being a bit too direct here, but very often the impression that I get is that we evolved from jujitsu. Jujitsu is like getting your hands dirty, and we don't want to get our hands dirty. We don't have to do that. We know more. You know, but knowledge, I think there's like maybe a little too much philosophy uh, and a little too much knowledge and not quite enough skill. Um, and th- that's, that's a problem. Knowledge and theory and skill are very different things. They're interrelated, but they're very different things. And I think, I believe people feel they have a certain skill set that they cannot prove because of the system which makes them just, I don't know, there's, there's this kind of reinforced belief that happens. And, you know, look, we're humans, we have egos. If the ego is, you know, we can't express that natural egoic function through competition, then it's gonna manifest in other places like um, pride in your school, pride in your particular style, pride in, I mean, your particular Aikido style, uh, where, you know, we don't do that kind, or we don't do Tomiki Aikido, we do, you know, Aikikai, and you kind of look down on these other things. I mean, it manifests in many, many different ways, and I think the reason Aikido is getting such a bad rap is a mix of the arrogance, uh, coupled with an absolute inability 
to demonstrate it working. And even people that might be loud, barking loudly about how effective it might be, they're not showing it. They're, they're still not showing it. Show me. Show me. A lot of people can talk a good game. They can talk uh, a good game online, on an online forum, or they can talk you know, in a vlog. But when it comes right down to it, people live in an era of scientific materialism and verifiable evidence. And there's very little patience for people that are delusional. And unless you can actually show Aikido working in the context, then just be quiet and do your own thing, but, but don't be looking down on anybody else. Um, and I think that would go a long way in fixing um, kind of the reputation blow that Aikido has suffered uh, in this modern martial arts era. Well, I do, I do feel where you touched quite a bit of that dark side and there's more to go, but, but there's, that was already a, quite a bit. Uh, but with all that, and that's kind of where you actually even finished your sentence of there, it's a, it would be a long way to go. Uh, but then uh, that's one of the reasons, uh, one of the many reasons I was looking forward for our talk so much is because uh, uh, you you have the experience in both, and I as as from what I heard, you are still passionate about Aikido as as much as I have that in, interesting moment too. Uh, after I published the MMA versus Aikido video, a lot of comments were just saying just ditch Aikido and just go do MMA or go do BJJ. But it's not where I want to go. It's just, just Aikido just still feels a part of me. It's just I. I started to recognize uh, publicly how many flaws and how many bads it has, but there's still a deep love for it. Uh, there's no way I want to lose it. I, I still see a lot of value, but I also am concerned about, okay, so where do we go as a, as a global movement? And, and, but, and you're still, a, it feels to me like you're still a part of that movement too. And I have a feeling you do have also a vision of uh, where Aikido could go and how Aikido could more or less, let's say, fix itself, or we could fix it as as everyone, because that's that's the reason. As much as I would love to talk uh, with you, just in, in general, for my own personal development, that's the other reason I wanted to really record this talk, is because, as I said, this can be a big inspiration for for many people, maybe people outside of Aikido, to to know better what to say to the Aikido people, uh, to help them wake up or support them in the evolution or the discovery that there's something else and well i'm sure you, you see where i'm going so um what do you feel and first of all do do you feel still a part of the aikido community uh and uh, just to to hear that uh, on, on our recorded talk uh, if what's your personal uh, relationship with aikido in this day and uh, also Again, the, the big question, so where, how can we fix Aikido? Honestly, I haven't really done an Aikido class in about 15 years. So I, even though I identify as an Aikidoka and I have spent a lot of time doing you know, various forms of traditional Jiu-Jitsu uh, and spent some time doing Aikido, it's really, I have not spent a lot of time with it. But that doesn't mean that I don't identify with it. Because Aikido is just jujitsu, and I love jujitsu in its myriad of forms. Um, when it when it comes to when it comes to uh, you know, basically, you don't want to leave Aikido, and people are telling you to ditch it. I mean, it feels like you'd be a traitor, right? In in order to leave this art that you love and which has influenced you. Um, and that you share with people and then you have, I mean, you have this community, it seems like it'd be a slap in the face to an art that's giving you so much. Or you could look at it as in order to save and inform what you know, you have to leave it because it's not going to spur the growth that you need. 
or that your students need. You know, it's not going to the same perspectives. You're doing Aikido, you're doing Aikido, you're doing Aikido, it's like an echo chamber of training. And in order to grow, you might need to step outside of it. Now, I don't really feel that I've left, ever left Aikido, but I left Aikido. And I'm still involved in it, but I'm not involved in it, you know? And I'm in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, but I'm not in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I, I, I feel like I'm kind of, I'm not necessarily tied to just one style. And you can love martial arts and, and do that. I feel that my contribution to the Aikido world is not treating Aikido. And, but being able to really understand what those techniques were, um, how they can be integrated in, um, doing an extended curriculum, essentially for Aikiroka, which is something that I'm gonna be doing with this uh, kind of new breed of seminar that Josh Gold and I are doing at Ikazuchi Dojo in uh, Irvine, California. We're essentially extending that Aik Aikido syllabus. Uh, if they counter um, a pin that you're doing in with a common form of resistance. How do you follow that up? And the kind of techniques that we use are still very much in line with the Aikido philosophy and, and it doesn't go into necessarily BJJ or it doesn't change into a different art. It's just an extension. And whether you want to give up Aikido or you want to keep going with it, I mean, the choice is yours. You gotta do what makes you happy. And, and people will throw advice at you all day long, right? Because it doesn't affect them. They're just happy to get something off their chest. But for you, I would, I would think about enhancing your study. You don't have to leave Aikido, but you should enhance your study, sometimes off the mat through conversations like this, and also through a little bit of cross-training. I think, I think it would be good for you, and I think that it would be good for a lot of Aikido out there to openly embrace it, have fun, and don't take it so seriously. You're not defending the art every time you step on the mat of another dojo. You're just playing around and making new friends. So it does seem like if we are, because I said we went quite uh, fairly enough deep to the dark side, uh, to give a, I'm sure both modern martial arts and traditional martial arts people who are watching this video as it's being published, uh, there is the desire to give some glimmer of hope, kind of more general glimmer of hope, like guidelines to where Aikido people who are, feel stuck at the same uh, trouble that I am or have the same discovery, they're coming into it or, or they've been there. Um, how would you, what would the steps, from your perspective, uh, what, would, what would the steps be to suggest to an Aikido person? Because I am already picking up whatever you said myself, uh, but just if, if we could break it down, what, what do you feel would be the solutions, if it's possible to say them, a few of the solutions that you would recommend or you would perceive would be healthy for Aikido to, to go back to the light and uh, to slowly go back to changing the reputation of it? Hopefully there is that <laughs> answer. I, I think it's there, and I, I think it is going to be holding fast to the traditions and to the technical syllabus, uh, Ikkyo through Yonkyo, and um, yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe you know, Swariwaza, all the traditional things that you do in the Aikido syllabus, uh, you should include that. But then there should also be, it's not necessarily a change in in technique, but it's more a change in philosophy uh, and toward openness and inclusion. And, oh, let's take a look at that and play around with it. I think the joy of Aikido needs to be a little bit more um, accommodating for other arts too. You, you need to extend it uh, so that there's a joy of discovery in playing around with something you're not that familiar with. And that will, uh, that will just eliminate any kind of style-based ego and turn it into something that's just much more simple. Playing around with another body and 
experimenting with angles and distraction and leverage and timing. Uh, I, I think we're at a critical juncture for Aikido. Um, a lot of the old masters are passing away. Um, there's an, obviously several generations of students, but I think it's time for us to focus on younger teachers, um, people that are vibrant and have beautiful movement and sharp technique and get other people excited about Aikido and then you know tell those stories and a lot of those people want to cross train or have cross trained uh, I think the glimmer of hope is in focusing on another generation of teachers and another generation of students and embarking on that story with them essentially that's what I tried to do with my BJJ Academy I filmed the process of launching an academy. I filmed my de belt demonstrations, um, rank tests, uh, and I had kind of an open source format for the entire world to see what it was like, what my standards were like, what those trials and tribulations were like of testing, and it's storytelling. And you involve people on that journey. And I think we're at a really unique time in terms of technology uh, and the age of Aikido so that we can tell additional stories, get people connected from around the world, and we'll see where the evolution takes place in the art, but it's a living, breathing thing. And I feel if we make it a little bit more personal um, and we involve a little bit more storytelling, uh, I think that we're going to get people involved um, that maybe wouldn't have looked at Aikido originally, but ultimately discover it's a good fit for them, both philosophically and in terms of um, you know what they can handle physically. Uh, Aikido has a lot of dangerous techniques in it, but um, for example, if you contrast it with MMA training, uh, MMA training is very, very rough, and you don't want to go in with a black eye you know, if you're a lawyer presenting a case or you don't want to have a broken foot. I mean, it takes away from the professionalism of your day job. And so to find that kind of middle path, I think Aikido can be a very strong middle path where you have a safe environment where experimentation is okay, technical experimentation is okay, um, failure is okay. and really developing self-confidence with the techniques. I think all of that is, is possible uh, in this new era. And then those discoveries can be shared with the community through stories, and that would rapidly fuel the evolution of this art. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it really sounds, really sounds true to me. And uh, I'll slowly do my best to start to wrap it up. Uh, but the, the two things that I picked up from what you said that went straight to me, uh, one is that I do recognize again uh, on the dark side of Aikido that uh, there is the hier the hierarchy system is quite strong as much as authority and respect is important uh, for development in my pers in my experience uh, that here he sometimes even myself starting the YouTube channel luckily enough my my sensei has uh, has uh, quite um, open views on on Aikido and that even but even then I wasn't sure if he's gonna like what I do on YouTube. Uh, but I was so happy that he supported me. But that that process, inner process, was there. Like I, I'm young and I'm not a you know a shihan. And in Aikido, sometimes that prevents people from going out there and uh, and showing their story because that image of you have to train for 40 years in Aikido and be 60 years old and have a you know white beard like Osensei, only then you can show yourself. Uh, it does feel like it's one of the limitations the art has. Uh, that kind of struck struck me as you spoke. That is so true. That is so true. I really feel like the hierarchy um, inhibits people from progressing, and you know, and in some ways, um, there's a gentleman named Robert Zepps, and when he accepted his black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, he talked about the fact that in Brazil they don't respect authority as much and they don't respect those hierarchies as much and by kind of going against the grain it allowed 
jujitsu to reinvigorate itself and to you know you're not just going to accept it and you're not just going to tank you're gonna you're actually gonna feel it out for yourself and I think that I think that's really powerful I I feel that I personally have been dismissed in the past um, f because I was only a first degree black belt in Aikido how, how could I even know anything how right it, how could I how could I have any insight if I'm only because you don't really know anything until you're a fourth dog Right? Right? It's so wrong. That is so wrong. You have no idea what my athletic background is. You have no idea, you know, how ta there's some very, very talented people out there physically. You can get good and very proficient under the right instruction. You can be, really, you can turn into a very formidable martial artist in three years. You know, with the right instruction, the right mindset, the right kind of training. And if you look at some of the early masters of Aikido, they only spent a few years with Osensei, Morihei Ueshiba. But yet they were able to glean the essence of his movement and understand the techniques and then go on and, and disseminate that information around the world. So I think that has actually hindered the progress. The respect for authority and hierarchy has in some ways hindered the realistic progress and efficacy of the techniques in Aikido. Yeah, yeah, definitely sounds true. It's it's really interesting when you say about Brazil, uh, what you said, I, I do notice that I did investigate some and I even made some videos about that in terms of the history and because I was so interested in it and I wanted to share what I discovered. But then uh, when I look at it now, it does seem that the Gracie family, if they would have been all about authority, then probably they wouldn't have felt the right to to continue evolving uh, judo because it started off from judo it wasn't uh, it was more or less judo totally. back then uh, and if they would have stuck with it and say oh no we have we don't have the right to continue then bjj probably wouldn't be so amazing this day so that that does at least ring a bell for me uh and it makes me think uh and uh so i want to start <laughs> making coming bringing this to the end to not make it too long for you especially but uh, the uh, one of the last things that I want to mention, uh, it did seem like more or less the main solution you do see in Aikido is is if you would have to choose one thing, it almost sounded like it's cross training. Cross training, I think cross training is useful because it shows you another paradigm for training. And you don't have to kind of invent the rules within Aikido. Aikido can stay Aikido. And you don't have to sully it with other things where, you know, you might bring in an element and then that element, you know, you know things come in and out of favor with your own training. Something you think is really great, you realize it doesn't work for you, you're not going to use it. I think a little bit of cross training, whether that is making your strikes much more effective and realistic by doing karate or Thai boxing or just regular boxing. I think that's part of the answer. I think cross training and BJJ showing you that you can actually apply. You can have a fully resisting opponent, fully resisting. And you can work to apply techniques on them and you can spar with a great amount of intensity without injuring that person. I, I didn't believe, I mean, in judo, you throw the person, it was mainly about throwing. I, I didn't do that much anymore so when I did judo. But you really can. It, when I was doing Aikido originally, I thought that was impossible. There's no way you could do a shihonage and not break somebody's arm. There's no way you can do this or that or wrist lock them or hit a nikio without injuring the person at full force. You know, I'd break the wrist if I did kodagaish full force. Well, you know what, try it. Try it. People don't react the way you think they react. You, ha you need to figure out, people need to figure out how people actually react. And how do you do that? You go out there and try it and fail and experiment. And then those are data points that you enter into your personal uh, warfare computer. 
And then you know how that person reacts. You know the amount of force you need to put into it. You know when that fails, you follow up with the next thing. I, th I think it's about cross-training rather than adding a lot of elements into Aikido. Because those lessons and those different paradigms for training uh, are something you can pull in. Um, maybe not in the first day, but over time, you'll be able to integrate those lessons and reinvigorate your own Aikido practice. Yeah, cool. Cool. Well, I feel it's endless. I mean, it would be a few more hours would you do well for this subject, but I do want to respect the time of you, uh, your time and also the audience has their limits too. Uh, this, this project is, I want to just mention quickly that there is the intention to, if, if this goes well, to keep on moving ahead and, and, and uh, I really like what you said about sharing the stories because I'm inspired about looking into that direction too. There's, there's still so much to do and I feel this is almost the beginning, not necessarily, not at all the end. Uh, but all in all though, uh, would you have some more, uh, some more last, some last thoughts to, to wrap it up, to sum it up or to leave the audience uh, a contemplation or a certain direction to look at after this video ends, uh, whatever that would be. Is there anything you're inspired to share uh, for the last few moments? I, I would just say, don't be afraid to become disillusioned. It's, it's actually better. It's better to work through it. It's better to, you get a more realistic understanding of what you actually know and what you can do. And it's a healthy stage. You know, there's all kinds of disillusionment, whether it's a tooth fairy or Santa Claus, or the fact that your favorite celebrity is actually, you know, perhaps uh, a less than considerate person in real life, or you know that your martial practice isn't as effective as you once thought it was, but that's okay. Because it's all about just enjoying this journey of exploration. We find ourselves here on this earth, don't take it so seriously, play around a little bit, and allow yourself to fail, and allow yourself to be disillusioned. I think you'll be better for it. Can you say just a bit more about, uh, because I'm, is it my English or something, but uh, in terms of allow yourself to be disillusioned? Yes. So what I mean is have your dreams um, exposed as false. Don't be afraid to pop the, pop the balloon, puncture the bubble. Don't be afraid to, to realize that what you believed could be a lie. It's a part of growth and we all have to do that over and over again. And I actually don't think there's any end to it. So disillusionment is actually seeing the truth, but in order to do that, you have to realize that what you previously believed was a lie. So instead of trying to protect the Don't try to protect the bubble. Don't try to protect the bubble. It's not worth it. And, uh, and you don't want it to the bubble to break when you really need it you know when you when you need that protective layer you, that's not the time for it to break it should be broken beforehand and then rebuilt uh, with stronger materials materials that you really believe in